I'm going to talk to you today about the global challenges of vaccination. To start with a brief history of vaccination, many believe that vaccination was the greatest public health intervention of the 20th century. Vaccination actually began with Benjamin Jesty in 1774, who inoculated his wife and sons with cowpox using a darning needle on their kitchen table to protect them against smallpox. He did this because he had seen that many milkmaids who were being exposed to cowpox were protected against smallpox. He was highly ostracised in the community for doing this, but his family subsequently survived several exposures to smallpox. Edward Jenner went on to take credit for developing the smallpox vaccine, and he named the process vaccination after the Latin word for cow, which is vacca. But Jester, Jesty was later recognised as the original developer of vaccination. It was more than 100 years afterwards that the next vaccine came along, which was the rabies vaccine in 1885, and here you can see the timeline for the development of multiple vaccines that we use today. This is the list of vaccine preventable diseases to date and hopefully we will continue to add to them in the near future. There have been many vaccine successes. Measles cases have been dramatically reduced. You rarely see cases of paralytic polio these days. Neonatal tetanus is very much reduced and there have been many other successes. Immunisation is one of the safest, most cost-effective and powerful means of preventing deaths and saving lives. Despite this, 6 million children still die every year before they reach their sixth birthday, many from vaccine-preventable diseases. Several of the Millennium Development Goals, those being to reduce child mortality and to combat HIV, malaria and other diseases, are obviously greatly helped by vaccination. There is now a really very real chance that measles and polio will be eradicated by vaccination and certainly polio is set to be eradicated quite soon if all goes well. The Global Vaccine Action Plan was endorsed in 2012 by the Member States of the World Health Assembly, Assembly and it set up a framework to prevent death by providing much better access to vaccination throughout the world. Some of their aims include strengthening routine immunisation to actually accelerate the control of certain vaccine preventable diseases with polio eradication as the first milestone and to introduce new and improved vaccines through improved research and development. So there are many problems with actually deploying um, vaccination programmes throughout the world. The main and most important program is the expanded program on immunisation, which was first established in 1974 to ensure that all children in all countries were able to benefit from six vaccines to save lives. Later, the goal was set of providing universal immunisation for all children by the year 1990. And although this has gone quite well, it has not obviously reached 100% for all sorts of reasons. In 2010, approximately 85% of children less than a year received three doses of diphtheria tetanus pertussis combined vaccine, which is used as a marker of successful vaccination delivery. The Independent Strategic Advisory Group of Experts, or SAGE, at WHO provide the evidence-based guidance on global vaccine policy. Here is a list of some of their recommendations from their position papers and you can see here that many of the vaccines are given to the ch children rather than adolescents and adults and you can see here BCG, Hepatitis B, Polio, DTP, Haemophilus, Pneumococcus, Rotavirus and Measles all being universally recommended for children. There are other um, diseases that need to be vaccinated against as well in certain areas such as yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis and tick-borne encephalitis. However, it's not an easy task to deliver vaccines to all children throughout the world. There are many, many roadblocks in the poorer countries of the world, and these are listed here, some of them. High costs of delivering vaccines, poor healthcare infrastructure, lack of trained staff, lack of vaccination facilities, very poor vaccination health records, extreme rural communities being very hard to access, lack of sustainable electricity supply, which are required to maintain the cold chain, and conflict has been shown to have a very big impact on vaccine delivery and leads to disease outbreaks in many countries. 
WHO tried to monitor the immunisation systems throughout the world using key indicators such as the number of children that receive their third dose of DTP by year one, but of course this doesn't tell the whole story. They also monitor the burden of vaccine preventable diseases. This is some WHO data showing how things are actually going. So on the left hand side we've got DTP3 coverage in the year 2000 and here we got it in 2015. Now there clearly have been some successes. So you can see here India is right down here in the 0 to 60% range and has now gone all the way up to the 80 to 90% range here. But other countries such as Nigeria here are not actually managing to meet the targets at all. Here we've got the um, world global coverage and you can see that it's gradually increasing but it hasn't yet re reached the 90% target that is the current target. And what you can also see here is that some countries are simply failing. So you can see huge decreases with some of these countries. The text is too small to read for you but it's a variety of different countries throughout the world, many of them poorer nations. Another problem with vaccination is vaccinating at the extremes of age. Now we know that infants and the elderly are more vulnerable to infections and have much higher rates of morbidity and mortality, but they also have quite different immune systems and therefore vaccines don't work as well at the extremes of age. And this presents specific problems such as the need for multiple doses, particularly in childhood, and also different formulations such as the conjugate vaccines for infants in whom the polysaccharide vaccines don't work. The figure on the top here shows how the immune system changes throughout life for a whole number of parameters and what you can see here is early in life children are born at term here with high Th17 supporting cytokines, very low antiviral immunity, very low Th1 support so they tend to be quite Th2 biased and poor innate immunity and pro-inflammatory responses but high levels of IL-10 which is anti-inflammatory. This then all settles down and by adulthood they generally reach a steady state but again in old age we start to see an increase in anti-inflammatory IL-10, a decrease in pro-inflammatory innate responses, a decrease in Th1 immunity and Th17 support but some people also go along this inflammaging line and this is an excessive inflammation which can be um, a predictor of poor outcomes and early death. The aging immune system is called a process of immunosenescence. So in terms of the actual pipeline for developing vaccines, this is a very complex and extensive process. It begins with preclinical trials in the laboratory um, and often testing in various animal models and then goes on to human clinical trials. Phase 1 trials involve tens to hundreds to up to a hundred subjects and these are safety and immunogenicity dose and route finding um, trials. The phase two trials are an escalation of the phase one trials which go into hundreds of subjects but also involve age de-escalation studies down to infancy if that's where the vaccine is targeted. Phase three studies are efficacy studies and often require thousands of people to see if the vaccine is actually efficacious and the phase four studies is after licensing of the vaccine to see if um, the vaccine continues to be safe when it's rolled out to the rest of the vulnerable populations. This vaccine development pipeline is extremely slow and this is the example of the RTSS malaria vaccine um, which has recently been licensed for use in humans and you can see that it was first created in 1987 and it wasn't until last year that it was um, licensed, almost 30 years after it was originally created. It's a very bureaucratic and expensive process to develop vaccines. There are extensive regulatory requirements, including the need to certify, patent, audit in clinical trials, the monitoring of clinical trials, safety reporting, ethics requirements, product registration. And as you go along that translational path, it becomes very difficult to actually change the vaccine construct and take into account new scientific findings. It's also extremely expensive, as I said. Um, the vaccine production costs are high, highly skilled and expensive staff are required, and in very large investments are required. So, for example, the RTSS vaccine development from G GSK and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have um, put $610 million into development of that vaccine, but other funds have also been involved. 
And ideally, partnerships such as private-public partnerships um, seem to work to actually develop vaccines. Adverse events and side effects of vaccination also cause concern for people and therefore can put people off taking up vaccines. Many countries collect data on adverse events following immunisation, but it's a very ad hoc process and some places will capture more data than others and it certainly is not a complete process. Adverse events can actually arise after the vaccine has been licensed and rolled out for a whole variety of reasons. For example, people can be excluded from trials who would um, that were excluded from the trials will now get the vaccine. So let's say pregnant women, women that are breastfeeding might get the vaccine. Um, many, many more people get vaccinated and therefore rare adverse events might get picked up that weren't picked up in the original phase three trials, such as the intersusception that occurred with one of the rotavirus vaccines seven to 10 days after immunization. Also, far more diverse populations will be vaccinated with different HLA types, different disease patterns locally. And many delayed adverse events may not be picked up in the pre-licensure testing. In fact, adverse reactions can also be expected. So it's often expected to get a local reaction to a vaccine. Systemic reactions can also occur. And other reactions include allergic reactions, which can be type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions, but also reactions to the non-antigenic components in the vaccine, such as egg products in some vaccines and antibiotics in other vaccines. Several vaccines have been shown to cause autoimmune reactions, so the MMR vaccine causes immune thrombocytopenic purpura with low platelet counts, and swine flu has been associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a neurological condition um, presenting with weakness. Just an example of how we expect vaccines to produce an inflammatory response. Here you can see an attenuated vaccine or a live um, a adjuvanted or live vaccine coming in, being taken up by dendritic cells and causing local inflammation here, causing um, with presentation to naive T cells, but also B cells and the produ production of antibodies. And in that process, a whole series of inflammatory mediators are released. So cytokines, chemokines, complement, proteolytic enzymes, etc. And obviously that will cause local inflammation. Here's some examples of local reactions. They can be just a bit of erythema or bruising. There can be swelling, induration, pain, and even ulcers and abscesses can, can be formed. It must be remembered, though, that BCG is supposed to produce a scar. And below you can see a few examples of some reactions. Systemic reactions are usually mild and usually manifest as fever, headache, lethargy and myalgia. But they can also manifest as gastrointestinal symptoms, respiratory systems, rash and localised lymphadenopathy. Vaccines are the second leading cause of febrile convulsions in the world and listed here are some of the vaccines that have been implicated but it's still rare to get um, febrile convulsions from vaccines and neurological sequelae are highly unusual. There's no link with epilepsy but if you are predisposed to convulsions then you may well be more likely to fit after vaccination and it's not a contraindication to giving vaccines in the future. The diphtheria tetanus whole cell pertussis vaccine has been particularly linked with systemic adverse ev events and as a result of that many countries in the West particularly abandoned its use in the 1980s and 90s and started using the less immunogenic but um, less reactogenic acellular pertussis vaccine. However it does require more doses and as I say is not as good a vaccine and this is thought to have contributed to a resurgence in pertussis, pertussis cases throughout the West. Here I've listed a number of specific adverse reactions to vaccines, the interception from rotavirus vaccine, yellow fever vaccine can cause severe neurological reactions and multi-organ failure, the varicella vaccine can rarely cause a pneumonia, MMR and MMRV can cause a number of neurological sequelae and low platelets, the um, both DTP vaccines can cause long-term seizures and brain damage, and influenza has been linked with Guillain-Barre in one to two cases per million vaccinated, as I mentioned previously. So there are a whole series of myths circulating about vaccination. These are that vaccines are not safe, that if you give too many, it overwhelms the immune system, that vaccines cause autism, diabetes, 
that hepatitis B vaccine causes multiple sclerosis, aluminium adjuvants cause Alzheimer's, and that vaccines are no longer necessary because vaccine-preventable diseases are no longer a threat. Well, I can categorically say that all of those are false. So something people may not be aware of is the non-specific effects of vaccines. And for those of you that don't know what it is, this is the MESH heading um, and on PubMed. And it's the phenomenon whereby exposure to a vaccine can alter the host's immune response to subsequent exposure to unrelated organisms or vaccines. By way of an introduction to this concept, I'm going to tell you about the high T to measles vaccine story. So this was a vaccine that is highly immunogenic and was introduced in 1989 by WHO to areas of high measles endemicity because it was thought to be a better vaccine for producing immunity in the presence of maternal antibody. At the same time, randomised controlled trials were conducted in a number of countries to look at the effect on survival and these are data from a study in um, Senegal looking at survival probability and what it found was that when you vaccinated males which are in blue with either the um, EZ high teta vaccine or, a contr or the control standard measles vaccine their survival probability was the same but what you can see here is that females in red that got the high teta vaccine were more likely to die. Data from Guinea-Bissau, a randomised controlled trial, showed exactly the same thing, with a 50% increase in mortality in the high T to measles vaccinated females. And as a result, the vaccine was withdrawn by WHO in 1992. This became the first widely accepted evidence of altered all-cause mortality after vaccination and the fact that these effects could be sex dif differential. But it was actually later shown that it was probably the subsequent DTP dose that increased the mortality twofold in females, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. On the whole, measles vaccination is considered to be a beneficial vaccine, and here's another study from Guinea-Bissau where um, children were randomised at six months of age to either measles vaccine or an activated polio vaccine, and again, survival probability, and you can see that those that got the measles vaccine were more likely to survive. And this could mean either a benefit from this one, or that this one's deleterious and increasing mortality, or a combination of the two, which is probably the case. This forest plot summarises 10 studies done throughout the world looking at measles vaccine efficacy against death. And you can see that it's always positive in these studies. Mostly the confidence intervals do not cross the zero mark and very high efficacy against death in some of these studies. It seems to be sex differential again. This looking at female male mortality ratios in the context of measles vaccination shows that it's always less than one apart from in this one study in Sudan up here, suggesting that females benefit more from measles vaccination. And none of these could be explained by improved protection against measles. BCG also seems to have beneficial effects. These are data from three randomised controlled trials conducted in Guinea-Bissau, where children of low birth weight who would not normally get the vaccine at birth either got the vaccine at birth in green or waited until they would normally get it. And these mortality rate ratios, and what you can see is that the mortality is consistently lower in those that got it at birth compared to getting it delayed, which would sometimes be um, two, four or six weeks after birth. The effects on mortality were quite rapid in males in the first few days, in females just after a week. And overall, there was a 46% reduction in death from getting these vaccines. The diphtheria tetanus whole cell pertussis vaccine, however, seems to be associated with deleterious effects. Here you can see the effects on survival once again in almost a thousand children who either didn't get the DTP vaccine or who did, and those that did get the vaccine are more likely to die, so lower survival. Now, there are many biases that might have occurred. This was just an observational study when the vaccine was introduced, but generally we think that children that actually have access to and get healthcare interventions are the ones that are more likely to survive. Once again, this was sex differential, and you can see that the female-male mortality ratio is greater than one in this case, suggesting females are the ones that are doing worse. An analysis of all available studies where DTP vaccination has been analysed in the context of child survival has shown that DTP vaccinated children have a higher mortality than unvaccinated, 
It's the, it's the vaccinated females that have higher mortality than the males. And if you can reduce the time to exposure to DTP as the most recent vaccine given by giving, giving a beneficial vaccine, then you can reduce child mortality. So just to summarise on the non-specific effects of vaccines, live vaccines seem to have beneficial effects, whereas the inactivated or killed vaccines have deleterious effects. They're generally stronger in females, determined by the most recent vaccine given, and they're very substantial with often up to 50% altered or caused mortality. The SAGE group at WHO set out to review the evidence concerning the nonspecific effects of vaccines and they concluded a couple of years ago that the epidemiological evidence does support protective heterologous effects of BCG and measles vaccine but there are insufficient evidence to support deleterious effects of DTP. They certainly didn't think there was enough evidence to change policy and they felt that more studies were needed which were highly powered by sex as well and recommended immunological studies because the mechanisms are really not understood. And that is something that I've worked on but won't be talking about today. So what are the implications of these non-specific effects? Do they actually matter? Well, one effect is that you could paradoxically get an increase in mortality if you withdraw a vaccine and replace it with a different vaccine if you lose the beneficial effects. And in fact, this is something that myself and others pointed out in a letter to The Lancet, that the changeover from oral polio vaccine to inactivated polio vaccine that actually happened last year in order to prevent cases of vaccine-associated paralytic polio may actually paradoxically increase the um, mortality and could even lead to an additional 300,000 deaths per year due to loss of the beneficial effects of the oral polio vaccine on all-cause mortality. So this is something that really does need to be borne in mind when these policies come into place. And I'm not saying that the change shouldn't have occurred, but maybe if we could understand these effects, we could then prevent um, loss of these benefits by actually mimicking them in some way. Also, the RTSS malaria vaccine, when um, a group went back to actually analyse the uh, mortality data, they found that there was a significant increased mortality in females following RTSS vaccination, and nothing to do with malaria again, um, but suggesting um, a non-specific effect, which is deleterious in the females. And this leads me on to the anti-vaccine movement and community acceptance. So obviously it's absolutely paramount that the community trusts us that vaccines that they are being given are safe. In actual fact, the anti-vaccination movement began at exactly the same time as vaccines were developed because in 1853 parents who did not vaccinate their children could actually be fined or imprisoned. Now, I think maybe that policy actually worked because smallpox was subsequently eradicated and um, this shows how successful a vaccine um, program can be. Another big problem has been the fraudulent paper published by Andrew Wakefield in The Lancet many years ago now, where he linked MMR with autism and colitis. He was subsequently found to have multiple conflicts of interest, he manipulated the data and he broke many ethical codes of conduct and the paper was subsequently formally withdrawn. And he was found guilty of professional misconduct. However, the damage done by this has been immense and there are many people that still believe that vaccines cause autism. And in fact, it's been described as the most damaging medical hoax of the last 100 years. The other problem is that as vaccine preventable diseases decline, people don't actually see children dying of those diseases and therefore they don't perceive or understand the risk. They then become more concerned about side effects and about other risks such as chronic diseases and have a, a warped view of the importance of vaccination and believe that it's not that important. And I think bad press has really a lot to answer for because they have really generated a lot of fear among people. There's also the problem that there is so much information out there, particularly on the internet, and this can confuse people, particularly when there's anti-vaccine movement that is very active in that environment. So what happens if you don't vaccinate? Well, one example was that the polio eradication program failed following a rumour in Nigeria that it contained birth control drugs to control the Muslim population growth. 
the um, Nigerians stopped giving the polio vaccine and this left many children in the hundreds paralysed with polio in recent years. There was also a polio outbreak in Syria because the vaccination chain had broken down due to conflict. In Europe and um, the West, pe many people have stopped vaccinating their children due to the fears of autism that I've just mentioned. And this has led to outbreaks of diseases like measles and pertussis making a comeback. Um, and I, even me as an infectious diseases physician, I'm seeing cases now of measles that we never used to see before in all age groups. But looking towards the future, where are we going in the vaccine field? Well, one encouraging thing is the um, recent licensing of the RTSS malaria vaccine. This is a particulate vaccine that is a fusion protein of the an immunodominant circumsporozoite protein of, of malaria, and that's with some T-cell epitopes as well, and linked to hepatitis B surface antigen, which then forms particles. It's the only malaria vaccine to have reached phase three clinical trials, and last year was limited for licensed for limited human use under the name Mosquirix. One of the problems with the vaccine, though, is that it only provides protection against that strain of circumsporozoite protein, but there are many other natural variants circulating, so would suggest it wouldn't be that useful in the field. And in fact, I think these data bear that out. So in the upper forest plot, you can see a whole series of studies with vaccine efficacy in the 5 to 17 month old age group and you can see that overall it's about 40%. And underneath we've got the efficacy in the 6 to 12 year, week old age group and it's even worse at around 30%. Now it's been estimated that to facilitate malaria elimination um, a vaccine should produce more than 85% sterile protection for more than six months. So this vaccine certainly wouldn't allow that to happen. And really, this vaccine is not going to be good enough to control malaria very well. There are many other strategies that are being tried in, in terms of the malaria vaccine development field, but also for many other vaccines. And one of these is prime boost strategies, often with recombinant DNA vaccines and a number of different viral factors. Here in the diagram, you can see an adenovirus prime carrying antigens and a modified vaccinia ankara boost. This is another um, highly modified um, vaccinia um, vector, which then goes on to produce potent antibodies and T cell responses. And um, this is one approach that many different groups are using for different diseases. Many people are developing nanoparticle vaccines, which range from virus-like particles to a series of synthetic nanoparticles um, based on polystyrene, for example. And these can be highly immunogenic and also less reactogenic than many of the other vaccines and vaccine adjuvants. Another approach has been whole organism vaccines. And one example would be the development of the malaria sporozoite vaccines by the company Scenaria in America, where they're actually um, producing multiple sporozoites and injecting the whole organism. And that has shown very promising results with sterile protection lasting up to a, a, over a year in um, many vaccinated subjects. The other thing that is happening is many new adjuvants are being developed to actually improve the immunogenicity of vaccine. Many of these work on the basis of stimulating innate immune responses through the pattern, recognized, pattern recognition receptors on, in, on immune cells. And these are pattern-associated molecular patterns, such as the toll-like receptor ligands, the nod ligands, the rig eye like receptor ligands, etc. And these are looking very promising as vaccine adjuvants. There are a number of oil in water and water in oil emulsions that are being used as adjuvants and also immunostimulating complexes, which are um, described here. Another interesting field that really hasn't been applied to infectious diseases vaccines but is being used in cancer vaccine therapy is immune checkpoint markers. And these are antibodies that block certain aspects of the immune system, such as anti-CTLA-4 antibodies, which prevent immunosuppressive effects and allow cells to work better, and anti-PD-1 program death-1 antibodies, which prevent the death and apoptosis of cells and therefore allow immunity to be boosted. And one area that I've been particularly interested in is targeting, targeting regulatory T cells because these suppress immune responses. And if you can decrease the regulatory T cell response, you can actually get a better immune response to vaccination. So these are all exciting new areas of vaccine development.
I thought I'd tell you about a few vaccines in development. One is the HIV RV144 vaccine strategy, and this is a, a prime boost strategy. And a huge study in Thailand showed that there was an approximate one-third reduction in the rate of HIV infection with the vaccine and about 60% protection in the first year of life, a uh, first year of vaccination. And therefore showing the proof of principle that a preventative vaccine against HIV is a real possibility. BCG, despite being a highly um, used vaccine, really isn't a very good vaccine for protecting adults against tuberculosis. It's quite good against childhood disseminated TB and it has very variable efficacy throughout the world. So there are many, many more candidate vaccines on the market and um, that have been going into clinical trials, but as yet nothing that um, has really got to the point where we're going to be able to license it. One of the issues with developing TB vaccines is that there are still not clear correlates of protection to actually use to guide early vaccine development. And that's also been a problem with malaria vaccines development. Another area of, of development has been um, with dengue vaccines. So Dengvaxia was um, licensed for use in 9 to 45 year olds in a three dose schedule in high endemicity settings. Um, but there are other number of other candidate vaccines for dengue that are being developed at the moment, in addition to this live recombinant tetravalent vaccine. There are also a whole series of new vaccine technologies. Now, one of them is needle-free delivery, which would be very attractive using either high-pressure jet injectors, nanopatches, or ultra-thin needles, which are just the size of a hairbreadth. And some of these could even be self-administered. There's also the whole issue of personalised vaccines, which is would be very, very expensive and not practicable for the whole world, but this is where a vaccine program is actually selected on the basis of individual genetic makeup and previous immunological experience. I've also mentioned vaccines against cancer, but there's also vaccines being developed against allergy, autoimmunity, addictions as well. So to conclude, vaccination is a highly cost-effective way to prevent and eradicate infections. Delivering them to all of those in need throughout the world, however, is a major public health challenge. Vaccinating the vulnerable young and elderly have specific problems relating to vaccine immunogenicity and, and their immune systems. The vaccine development pathway is very slow, is highly bureaucratic and very expensive. All vaccines cause adverse events, but generally a low rate of serious adverse events, otherwise they wouldn't be licensed. Vaccines have non-specific effects, which can impact morbidity and mortality. And the anti-vaccine movement is causing a lot of public scepticism and decreased vaccine uptake with an outbreak in vaccine-preventable diseases. However, many new vaccines are being developed using novel technologies, and this is a very exciting time in the vaccine field. So I'd like to thank you with that and just remind you how important vaccination is. So please do support it. Thank you.